What's new in filmmaking technology this week? News, reviews, education, insights, opinions, and ideas from the Cine D Newsroom with Nino Leitner and Johnny Bahiri. This is Focus Check, the weekly Cinetech podcast. Welcome to Cine D Focus Check episode 7, our podcast. Today, for the first time, I'm with Jacob, one of our most, well, longest term writers, I think, on the site. Hi, Hi Jacob. Hi, Nino. I'll get into why you're here in a second, but just to start this off, I want to say that this is one of the busiest weeks. Uh, we're just ahead of NAB. Uh, the majority of the team is heading out to Las Vegas tomorrow, and we will cover the show. We'll do lots of videos from NAB as usual about new products and so on. But as every year and uh, like with every trade show, just ahead of the trade show, a lot of announcements are already happening. And we will go through some of the most interesting ones today. We cannot cover everything that we're covering this week in the podcast simply because it's too much. Uh, but there will be another podcast that we will record actually in Las Vegas just before we depart on the last show of the day next week. Um, and that will be published next Thursday. But we will you know, cover the most important things, I think. And the most topical thing, and that's why you're here, DJI just announced the Avatar 2. And you had a chance to review it uh, early on. We just published a very nice, very long review that you did, 17 minutes, about the new Avatar 2 uh, FPV drone. Yeah, let's let's dive right in. So, Jacob, you've been flying with FPV drones for a number of years, right? Uh, what is, you know, what what's the allure of actually flying an FPV drone as opposed to a normal drone? Well, it used to be not so easy. Uh, I mean, to fly FPV drone, uh, it depends how you fly it. Uh, DJI is actually trying to, I would say, democratize FPV flying. They've been trying since the first DJI FPV, then the first Avata, now the second one. And um, well, if you want to fly... you build them yourself, right? The normal FPV drones. That's how it started, yes. People building their own drones. If you fly it manual in a, full, in a fully manual mode, uh, it's difficult. Obviously, you need to train. You need to spend hours in the simulator. Because it, it doesn't actually like a normal FPV drone. And that's when, I mean, I reviewed the first Avatar having no experience with or Was it actually the, Avatar? It was FPV, a DJI FPV, yeah. And FPV. And having no experience with FPV drones. And what I had to get used to is that actually the, the controller sticks in place when you move it. So it actually always moves, right? It doesn't really stand in the air. Yeah, the thing is, uh, with this controller, DJI, uh, on default, it's normal, like, it's, it's going back, the throttle sticks, is bumps back, you know, in normal, because for the normal and sport mode, you still fly it as a normal drone, as you would fly the Mavic or whatever. You need to adjust it for the manual mode for the throttle, throttle stick to stay in place. But for normal FPV drones, they don't even have this mode, right? You just yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, it's always that's, that's how you fly. Yeah. Always fully manual. It's like you really need to you need to feel the throttle. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you actually need to train flying with those drones. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, you will, you will crash. I mean, you can try, but you will crash, and it's yeah. expensive. I mean, so you said DJI is trying to democratize FPV flying. So I mean, what what does it mean actually? FPV drone. It means that you're you're kind of getting all the movements of a drone, right? Because a normal drone would always keep the horizon level. And this one is is it's like really can do spins, it can it can turn, it can do crazy movements and go through very tight spaces. Yeah, so FPV drones, the difference is a regular drone is gonna has a mechanical gimbal that stabilizes everything what you film. FPV has a one axis gimbal, so if the drone if the drone turns, you see it in the video. Um, you feel the movement in a different way. The drone always looks forward, so you fly through stuff. Uh, mm. Usually, you don't fly backwards or sideways with FPV drones so much. Um, yeah, it's we a different... see some of the footage from your review here for people who are watching the video podcast, and uh, you can see the different feeling of the shots, right? Um, yeah. Really nice. So um, what do you think? I mean, uh, it's been, what, two years since they announced the first one, I think? Uh, it might have been two or three years. Two or three years. And uh, the first one being, well, the first one really was a DJI FPV, which was, what I read, it was kind of a heavy drone in a it's way. It's a heavy, scary drone, I would say. It's actually very heavy. It's a, I, I remember it's like 900 grams or something, I almost a so, kilo. Yeah. 
meaning if you crash that, it's really it can cause some damage. And uh, and then they announced the, later the Avata, which is much lighter and much more similar, I would say, right to normal Cinewoop. The Cinewoop, how we call yeah. it, Cinewoop. Yeah. No, I like the. Usually, you know, I like second generation of products because the first one always brings something new and then the second one refines it. And this is exactly it. Like it looks similar to the Avata, but it's better in, in every way. They improved really a lot. And I'm talking about it in the review. Uh, there is not much to complain about the drone. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it looks a little bit more similar to a traditional drone in terms of the batteries. You have this big battery that goes in at the back. And uh, you mentioned in the review that, I mean, FPV drones usually work with LiPo, drone, uh, LiPo batteries, right? Yeah. Which you actually really have to take care of. You have to discharge them if you yeah. don't use them. Actually, I made that mistake with my first gimbal <laughs> with a Movi M10, not doing that and really destroyed the batteries. Um, yeah, yeah. the battery the workflow is really something that makes flying with uh, DJI drones in general much easier. So now that you have the easy... Battery workflow with FPV drones as well is is very nice because I fly with my FPV drones, I fly with LiPo batteries and you really need to take care of them. I mean, I'm also talking about that in review. You really need to know what kind of voltage the batteries uh, are supposed to be at. You know, you set the charger. If you have 6S, 4S LiPos, that's a different uh, voltage. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not that easy, yeah. With but the DJI drones, you just charge the battery, put it in and... Well, I have a provocative question. Why do you even need any other FPV drones? Like, yeah, CineWoop. Is it? Is there any... What's the advantage? Because this one, of course, has a dedicated camera, where as normal CineWoop drones, you would put a GoPro or another action camera on top, and then you have to wire it, and you have to take care of all this. You have a separate video transmission. I mean, in the old days, this tink tinkering made sense because there was no other way of achieving this, and now you have a out-of-the-box product so where are still the advantages of kind of doing it yourself? That's a good point, yeah, because the Avata 2 changes stuff, at least for me, because now when we have this kind of image quality already in the primary camera of the drone, I don't see a point of putting a, something like a GoPro on my drone anymore. It's just too much of a hassle. This is much easier to fly. Where it makes sense, maybe you have uh, very lightweight drones, like under 250 grams, uh, this is not under 250 grams, so for this uh, purpose, you might still want to use something else. And on the other hand, you have a heavy cine lifter drones that can carry like a Red Komodo or even Alexa Mini or yeah. larger cameras like that. Then, then it makes again sense also. But in, yeah, this, FPV, in this weight category... FPV doesn't necessarily mean small drone, right? It can be anything that's first person view. So it can be actually a very large camera exactly, on top of yeah. a cine lifter. Yeah. Um, that that's where like I I first thing I when I hear FPV I think about a small drone. It doesn't have to be a small drone. I mean a lot of people for uh, cinema shooting they actually put a Komodo on top of a big drone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So you you don't see any point in actually flying your other drones anymore in a way. For me, not anymore. I mean I have to return this to DJI, so yeah, I'll yeah, have to. Exactly. But <laughs> yeah, I don't see a point after this. No? Yeah. I mean one of the I mean let's talk about image quality for a second. Um, uh, you said it has the sensor of the Osmo Action 4, right? Uh, so it's it's the same thing as, as their latest uh, action camera. Yes, uh, the sensor is the same. I think the processor might not be the same because the Avata 2 cannot record 4K 120. But the image quality is very, very similar, which is a good thing because I think Gunther found out in his review that the Osmo Action 4 is actually better than the Hero 12. That's the first time, actually, in our review of the... Yeah. Uh, maybe we could put a link in the show notes uh, where he did a comparison between the Osmo Action 4 and the Hero 12, it was, yeah. yeah. Uh, the first time that, in his opinion, that the uh, action cameras from DJI have surpassed the GoPros, which is kind of a huge deal because GoPro exactly, is yeah. like a company built on one product in a way. I mean, they used to have a drone, which they discontinued, and yeah. but they really only have the, the action camera, and now DJI is offering is is better in terms of image quality so that's kind of amazing yeah but it's supporting my idea because usually people put the latest gopro on their fpv drone and now when we have the same sensor basically the same camera already in the drone on the drone yeah. it doesn't make sense to mount gopro on a drone for me anymore 
Absolutely. And if you think about it, I mean, this is still, com in comparison to the camera on to on the drone, the action camera is still big in a way, yeah. right? It's like, it's amazing. All right. Um, what, are the, what are the biggest differences to, to the first version in terms of flying and image quality? Uh, image quality is better, of course. The sensor is larger. Uh, the resolutions and frame rates, I think, stayed the same. Uh, the drone is lighter, more than 30 grams lighter. Uh, the access to SD card and USB-C port is much better now because with the first Avata, it was actually inside next to the propeller. Mm. And it was, first of all, very uh, hardly accessible. And second of all, I even found out online that some, some people had an issue that the cover came loose oh. mid-flight and destroyed oh, no. one of the propellers and made the drone crash. So okay. not the best design so now it's so in the, the more traditional that. position actually yeah now it's in the middle you can side. access it very nicely yeah okay the battery is now much better as you said already you have this uh, kind of standard uh, type of battery what dji is using where you just sl slot the battery in the drone with the avata it was still i think you had to connect these two cables mm -hmm. and uh, the battery looked a bit different but in terms of i mean they actually it's not just a drone that's new uh, they announced a new set of goggles, which I think are even more revolutionary in a way because that's, that's a huge step forward. What's what's different about them? Yeah, actually, not only goggles, but even both controllers are new. Like the whole set, every, every part is new. The whole set, but the goggles, they have now cameras. Uh, the design is kind of an evolution because already the last the goggles Integra had this uh, battery on the back of the headband. So now it's all in one. You don't need any cables. You don't need external battery. It's just uh, all so in one. Actually, we have to mention this to people who are not watching the video that, yeah, it's now a piece of, well, uh, goggles with a strap around the head. And at the back of your head, you have the battery. Which, which is, is good because it balances the weight, right? You have exactly. a weight at the back and in the front. So, so actually, DJI solved Apple's... Uh, Design Maybe Apple should have done this too. Yeah. <laughs> of the of the Vision Pro, yeah. which is just dangling down your back. So this is something that Apple should take a note with. Um, that of course makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and also because I mean, what's also similar, you said it has cameras. Does that mean it offers some kind of augmented reality mode? So you can kind of see through the the the. Yes, you can see through. You can switch to something what DJI calls real view. So when you double tap the side of the goggles. It switches the view from the drone's camera to these two cameras in the front. So you can change battery in the drone or you can stop, start recording on the camera if you're recording yourself without taking off the goggles, which is pretty nice. And uh, this is available in 2D, 3D, because obviously you have two cameras, so it can combine the view to give you a 3D experience. Or there is a picture-in-picture -picture mode which shows you both the drone and the real view at the same time. Very nice. So actually, yeah. So so you mentioned the review that the field of view is quite limited, no? In the real for me, view. yes. The feeling of the real view is, uh, yeah. The the field of view is a bit narrow for me. Yeah. Let's just skip to that part in the. Oh, here it is. Yeah. In the review. So that's that's actually what you see. It's that narrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that. But at least, I mean, you don't have to take them off. But even if you have to take them off, it now re rests on your forehead, right? So you can do this. Yeah, at first I thought you can you can flip it up, like like flip them up totally, ah, but you cannot. No, you it cannot. doesn't you actually just adjust them. Ah, it's just an adjustment. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. yeah, just to flip it up. Okay. But it helps also. I mean, now it sits on your forehead, not on your eyes. Yeah. So it's, it's pro nice. probably can wear it longer without getting yeah. any headaches or something. Okay. It also has diopters to adjust for. Yes. Uh, yeah, nice for your eyesight. Very nice. So that's a lot more advanced. Do these only work with the Avata 2 or can you use this with other DJI drones as well? Because I remember the old goggles, you could use them with other, other I drones. think you can. I'm yeah. not 100% sure, but I think you can. But it's always, we have to check on that. I think yes. uh, also with the old ones, they were not compatible with every drone, just with mm. some of them. But yeah. that's, of course, very nice. Okay, let's move on finally to the controllers. Um, so we have the motion controller. This is the second version or third already? Um, uh, they, call it R they call it RC3. Okay, there must have been a second but one that I missed. I probably missed the second one too. It's much I mean, I've, I've, never, I've never used much these motion controllers because I'm 
like I said, I fly other FPV drones, so for me the controller is, is just two sticks and that's it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this one, it's smaller than the previous generation and it has one very cool feature, which is called Easy Acro Mode. So if you are very skilled, you fly with FPV drones for many years, you can do flips probably because it's possible with sticks, obviously, but uh, it's not that easy. I crashed a drone myself trying front flip back <laughs> in the days. But now with this controller, you just activate the easy acro mode and with the joystick on your thumb, you just move it in the direction where you want the okay, you drone just, to flip yeah. and, and it just does that. You know, at first I thought it's not going to be usable for the footage because the flips are quite fast, but then yeah. I saw it and after the stabilization, it's actually really nice. Okay, so front and side flips, as we can see here. Back, front and side, yeah. and and some slide and other moves like that. But in general, I mean, the, the motion control for people who haven't used it, this is basically, there's a gyroscope inside, and when you move it left or right or front or back, it kind of moves with that, right? Exactly. It's like, yeah. uh, it's like following your movements. So it's a very intuitive way of um, operating it. That's but true, of yeah. course, probably you can't be, do as crazy moves because you can't even... Move it as fast as a as Yeah, a exactly. Outside of the easy acro mode, you cannot do that crazy move. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I think it's more for the beginners. And that's another advantage of the drone because the Avata 2 just offers fun for every skill level. It doesn't matter if you are a professional FPV pilot or you're just one, just beginning with drones. It's like, you can fly the Avata, you can have fun. Yeah. Nice. Last but not least, controller is new. Looks very similar to the old one. Looks very similar. The only difference visually what I can see is the antenna used to f flip out. Like there was this antenna, this plastic antenna that flipped out. Now it's all internal. Um, yeah, it has all the necessary buttons. But nothing major changed. Nothing major from. changed. No. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Are you going to buy the Avata 2? Oh, I cannot keep it. Oh, uh, unfortunately, I think they I was, asked I was thinking. but when you send it to us, like you have to send it back on that day. Oh, damn. <laughs> no, know. I'm thinking to buy it. And to it's much easier to fly, like I said. Very cool. So that was not the only product that DJI announced two days ago. They also announced uh, the RS4 and the Focus Pro. And for that, I'm going to talk to Jeff, our writer from France, who's actually visiting us here in Vienna because he's coming with us to NAB. And thank you, Jacob, and see you. Well, soon again on the podcast. See you soon. Let's move on to Jeff. Jeff! How are you doing, Nino? First time in Vienna, first time on the podcast. Welcome. First time in Vienna, first time at the office, first time in Vienna, first time everything. First time NAB from tomorrow. I exactly. Mean, well, not from tomorrow. We're going to spend a lot of time in a flight together. That's really true. Luckily, you're in a different aisle, in a different row. So <laughs> I'll be fine. No, just kidding. So you wrote about the new RS4, RS4 Pro, and also the, what is it called? Focus Pro set that DJI announced. That's the second, second big announcement of DJI this week. Exactly. Let's start with the gimbal. So we're both users of the RS3 Pro, right? I use it a lot on shoots. You use it a lot on shoots. Now they announced the RS4 Pro. And am I the only one wondering What's why new? there is an upgrade? Because... <laughs> At first glance, there are not so many changes, right? That's true. I spent quite a lot of time uh, trying to find what was really new about the RS4 and RS4 Pro. Um, same payload capacity, same overall design. So if you are an RS3 or RS3 Pro user, you... You will know your way around. Yeah, you, you will feel at home. Uh, it's a little bit heavier though, right? It's a, like 100 grams. Something. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit heavier, but same payload capacity. The motors are 20% stronger. Um, Which is good. I mean, I, actually, I never had a problem with the 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 capacity of the motors. I mean, I, I started using gimbals with a Mobi M10, which was very finicky to balance. Yeah. Every time you change a lens, even just a filter, you would have to rebalance and really interrupt the shoot for 15 minutes or something. Um, and with the Ronin series in general, even already starting with the earlier ones, also with the Ronin S, the first one-hand gimbal, I felt like it's very tolerant to change. Yeah, over the years, they really improved uh, how much room yeah. you have. Like back in the days, they were much more, 
strict. You had to be really yeah. On you had point to be on point. Yeah. Otherwise, it was it was a nightmare. Uh, and then of course, the what I love is the standby mode that you just press and then it locks automatically all the three axes and you can do stuff and then just press again and can continue shooting. Yeah, DJI says they did a version two of the auto lock oh, uh, nice. feature. We, well, we have to say we haven't reviewed it yet. We have Not it here. Yet. We didn't have time to review it yet. We will review it. Um, but, you know, like, I mean, this is really all based on the specs and what we saw of the unboxing, really. So, um, I am I mean, DJI is really, really good in, in, in adding new iterations and enhancing a lot of features, I have to say. I mean, usually they, you know, do their homework. It's just at first glance, there are not that many differences. The biggest improvement is... On the quick release plate, they took something they introduced with the RS3 Mini, mm -hmm. uh, where you can switch from horizontal to vertical without any tools or third-party piece of gear. And that's that's handy. You know, more and more content is shoot vertically. So now you can switch from horizontal to vertical within seconds and without any tools, which is very handy, but it was something they already introduced with the RS3 Mini. So it's just a feature that is now yeah. with, with the Pro Series. Well, it's definitely nice to have, as you said, there's more and more shoots that really require vertical shooting and they say it's done doable in seconds. You tried it before. It is possible. It uh, is possible uh, without in seconds and without reading the instructions. So it's it's definitely doable. Yeah. Uh, everybody will find their way. It's just two buttons to press. It's fairly easy. Um, I think the 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 monitor looks a little bit different when it's switched on, right? I think you can ha also. Uh, <coughs> There's an additional switch. Oops, sorry. There's an additional switch here. Yeah, there's an additional switch on the left side, uh, which changes what the joystick does, if I'm correct. Um, um, yeah, isn't that something Alex said before about the changing from aperture? No, from focus to zoom, right? Um, you can switch from focus to zoom if it's connected to your camera. Which is funny because Alex pointed out that actually you would want focus to aperture, which is more that you would need because not every, I mean, there's not a lot of lenses you would put on there that actually have a motor in the zoom. That's so, true. So, um, uh, yeah, but, you know, it's nice to have. I mean, in general, the camera connections work really well with the Raven Eye and all the uh, the wireless stuff uh, if you set that up correctly. Um I think one of the bigger improvements, and I, I sometimes use the RS3 with, uh, well, often use it with the motor. Mm -hmm. uh, and to pull focus here, I actually only started doing this recently because I've been shooting this documentary on anamorphic lenses, so I don't have any autofocus, of course, available. Um, so I use the motor, the old motor for the three. Um, I just sometimes find it a little bit almost too strong. Um, and I think this, they said, is a bit more refined in general, like how it operates, the new motor. It's actually 30% stronger uh, than the previous version. Stronger, motor. but I hope you can also tone it down <laughs> in terms of... You're supposed to be able to tune it down. Um, the biggest improvement with the motor is actually with the RS4 Pro, you can now connect two motors, one for mm. the Focus and one for... The aperture or the zoom, however you yeah. like it. Uh, and on the motor itself, the Focus Pro motor, you can assign if it's uh, a Focus, Iris or Zoom motor yeah, on the, the side. The fit settings um, here. It's it's fairly easy. And two USB-C ports to daisy chain the two motors, I guess. Yeah. Power them. Mm -hmm. They really did a good job on, on the motor. It's it's one of the biggest improvements, I think. Yeah, very nice. Look, I'm looking forward to trying it out. Um, I think it's a more refined product. It's 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 certainly not a revolution, but it's a good evolution. I think if you're an RS3 or RS3 Pro user, justifying an upgrade will be hard, except if you yeah. really need the new features. Uh, but if you're coming from the RS2 or even the first... Uh, what was it? The first DJI uh, Ronin S. Ronin S, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you, you, it's worth the upgrade. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, yeah. I have to say in general that uh, you know they've. I mean, there, there's there's been a couple of years ago at NEB and also IBC at the pre trade shows we saw 
so many, especially Chinese companies releasing gimbals, it was almost becoming a running gag between us that like, you know, like if they don't know what to release any company, they would release a gimbal. And um, I think now it's really, it's only a handful of companies that still make new generations. There's, there's DJI, there's Zion and who else? I mean, there's not many anymore. And I think honestly, because of the quality and how good the the RS series is from DJI, I find it a very hard to, you know, even uh, there's really no need for anything else. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, they really refined this product to the max in a way. And the RS3 already did so many things that I didn't never expect a, a gimbal to do. So. Yeah, that's true. They, they increased the payload capacity so much. We are talking about 4.5 kilos uh, on the Pro version. So if you need anything to go higher than that, you will switch from a one-handed gimbal to something much bigger. Like the well, you can use two handles on this too. Yeah, which oh, I yeah do with usually. the tilt ring and yeah. stuff, you can fully accessorize it. But if you really need to fly, let's say, or, um, an More RE than, yeah. 45 or something like that, something much bigger, you will go. Yeah, you have, you have the budget for it. You will go for something bigger. You use the Trinity, Artemis, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing we forgot to mention: there is now an optional bigger battery, which is significantly bigger, and of course makes the the w total weight quite a bit higher. I mean, honestly, I never had a problem running out of battery with this. Usually, you can run Same. For two days with one of them. Yeah. Sometimes, of course, I mean, it's good to have a spare if you forget to charge it at the end of the day. Um, but other than that, yeah, of course, it's nice to have. I mean, it's very large. It's longer. Um, it should give you, DJI mentions, 2.5 times more yeah. runtime. So around, I think it's like 29 hours <laughs> with one charge. Wow. It's crazy. Well, I guess if you bo use both motors with it, of course, it will char it will use more of course. power. Okay. Of course. But let's move on to the other announcement of that day, which actually I think is more exciting. Um, DJI also announced the Focus Pro set. And this is something that I have been really waiting for for years. Now, when the Ronin 4D was announced and I reviewed that, there were a couple innovations in there that really stood out. And of course, everybody kept talking about the fourth axis uh, arm, which is great, but... The second big innovation, which was kind of like sidelined because it's not as obvious, was the LiDAR that was built in. LiDAR autofocus, which basically means that you can make manual cinema lenses into autofocus lenses. And it already worked really well on the Ronin 4D. Problem being, it was very limited because, of course, the, you could only use it on the Ronin 4D and you were very limited with small lenses. Actually, they upgraded it with... and you. In between, they upgraded it, right? On the uh, between the 4D and the RS3 Pro. Exactly, there was one, but you um, could still only. I think but with the RS3 Pro, it worked. Like there, there was a similar looking lidar module. But were you able to put? You were not able to put it on any camera. That's what I mean. It's like you could not just. You could take it off already and put yeah. it on. Really? With the with the RS3 Pro, you could put it on and use it with any camera and get no, but on a tripod. Auto focus like on a tripod. No, that's what I mean. Like, oh, okay. like literally have fully independent. No, exactly. Just have the because you had to compromise. You had the autofocus exactly. on the gimbal, but you could not just take it off and just use normal tripod shots. And now they finally did this. I yeah. mean, you can. This is a set. Um, so there is a new lidar. Uh, well, what is it? Lidar camera actually. Lidar sensor. Sensor and camera. And camera. Yeah. Uh, the camera side is the same. I guess it's still thirty millimeter. Um, but the um, the lidar part itself is brand new. You have nearly twice as much uh, range ranging points, like seventy something thousand. Yeah, or it's so. it's yeah. huge. So it's, it's all huge. the measurements it takes for the distance. Yeah, between the lidar sensor and the everything it's pointing at. Basically. Yeah, basically. Uh, usually people, but it can be objects too. But it can it, be objects. It can be cars. It can be. Well, anything, I guess. I Pretty mean, much the... anything, but DJI built new algorithms for, mm -hmm. for it, which now auto-tracks cars and stuff. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to trying this out. on. An... Actually, I will use it on a different camera and something which is not on a gimbal. And they introduced a 
a separate grip which is very similar to the battery grip on the RS4 and RS3, uh, which is actually, it also has the same kind of monitor here. And I think you can get a preview of that camera, right? Exactly. So this, and this is not a camera you would record. It's a camera that it's, it's just showing you what's kind of like within the focus field yeah. of view, right? What the LiDAR sensor is actually... Sees. Yeah. Yeah, what it sees and what it's focusing on. But the real core of the entire system is that Focus Pro handle uh, that you attach on the side of the camera and that makes it totally independent from... Like yeah. you don't need to plug it to a gimbal or whatever. You can just attach the handle on the side of your camera, plug it to the LiDAR sensor and the focus motor, and you're ready to go. Yeah, we see it here in the promo video. Um, so this is how it works. They actually put it on a different camera, which is not on a gimbal to, sh to showcase it. And you can see it. Of course, you can put it on a gimbal, but you don't have to. And uh, yeah, this is a good example for a setup here. Yeah, that, that can be a convenient little setup here. I mean, that's very nice. If you think about it, just having the ability to have autofocus on a lens like that, um, which is a completely mechanical lens, is amazing. I mean, one thing that's also great, I think, is that the, the range is now larger. It's 20 meters and it yeah. used to be 14. Exactly. Although I think it was a little bit of a stretch. I never managed to get 14 meters. And of course, that's if, if a person comes close to your camera... It will catch it at some point. But one of the functions that I really love at the Ronin 4D, which of course this brings to um, now every camera, is the uh, ability, well, first of all, to have this AMF mode, this, uh, what is it, auto manual focus? Uh, you can, I guess DJI calls it AMF. Uh, so basically, it switches between auto and manual within milliseconds. Like if you feel that your focus is slowly drifting or it's catching something else, you just have to turn one knob mm -hmm. and boom. You, you take back it. control over it yeah. and you can focus whatever you want. There is a special dampening and it happens yeah. so fast. And it's something that I really recommend everybody to try out because it's something I didn't really understand before I use it, but it works really well. So yeah. what you, like you were saying, it's like basically, for example, I have eye tracking on you. I move, for example, with a gimbal and it, I just know it from the Ronin 4D and then it drifts or actually it, it doesn't even have to you. drift. For example, it has your eye in focus and suddenly I decide I want to refocus on something in the foreground, an object. Exactly. That's very hard to do with an autofocus. I mean, there, you know, like, like there's some, some cameras which have like touch screen and then you touch and then it refocuses, but you can't really control the speed of how fast it does that. Exactly. And in this case, you can just turn the wheel and it overrides the autofocus. It disables it for the time that you're operating this. And I think it jumps back into the autofocus once you let go. I'm it, not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, not sure, sure about anymore, that. Yeah. But it, the way they designed it is so smart because as soon as you start turning it and taking over you're telling the system where you want to focus and when the system understand where you want to go he will like for example if you want to go from uh, a person to the background you will just have to move the focus wheel to the background and he will understand that you want to focus to the background and not focus to the the foreground and it's, it's not jumpy it's really smooth. yeah it's really yeah. smooth i think i think this the way even if it's not within this system but some kind that's like an assisted manual focus i think that's what the a is for it's probably not auto manual it's assisted manual focus exactly and i think this is something that really will find its way also in higher end uh focusing systems because it just makes so much sense of course yeah. canon also has it with its uh cinema lineup of cameras and it, it, it just works so well that now, like, it's crazy to think that you can take any cinema lenses and pretty much makes it makes it out of focus, yeah. even in the toughest lighting condition, because it's a LiDAR module, so it doesn't really care about the lighting conditions. Of course, it has some limits. I mean, if yeah. you're, like, super wide angle, but honestly, I mean, on a super wide angle, there's not so much chance to actually pull focus anyway, but... There are limits, but they are, or if you're a super telephoto, like if you have a 300 mil on there, it's like, you know, that's, but 
still. I mean, that's just the ability. One thing that I wanted to mention that's also coming in from the Ronin 4D is their uh, waveform autofocus, which you see here. Yes. That is um, it's a very brief clip here. What you he see here on the right is basically a bird's eye view of what's in front of your camera. So, for example, here, this this green line here, uh, well, actually, I think the, yeah, it's the yellow line here, actually, that shows you what's in focus, I think. And that's this guy. And, and you see that this blob here is kind of like, it's a bird's eye view. So that means you see here on the, on the left, well, actually only for people who watch the video, but <laughs> it's basically a top-down view of what's in front of your camera. And uh, it's a very intuitive way of focusing because you will know this represents the image from left to right. And then you see on the left here, the guy in the foreground, which who is out of focus. And here um, in kind of the middle, the guy who's in focus and then you can pull focus between the two by simply looking at the arrows moving around and you you're literally turning your wheel if you use the the hand unit for example you can you can do that very easily or of course on the gimbal with the wheel i think that's a very very smart and intuitive way of very accurately pulling focus and this now using the combination of this this focus pro unit means that you can use this with any camera as well Exactly. It's totally independent. So you can use it with every camera you can think of and make every lens autofocus. It's the first time that such an independent system um, hits the market. Yeah, I think this is going to revolutionize a lot. It's like, uh, you know, like uh, people talk about the RS4 Pro, but in reality, this is going to be a much more popular product because it's, it's, it's going to gonna go everywhere once people realize how powerful the 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 technology is and I look forward to trying it I mean this shot is a good example of overriding the autofocus uh, with the assisted manual focus and uh, yeah and that the hand unit can be combined with their uh, wireless monitor um, I really have to look into this more um, but yeah it's, it's the hand unit also has been revamped uh, oh, yeah, with a new, a new dampening yeah um, built in uh i quickly tried it uh it's it's crazy it's very smooth now it, yeah it feels so good and you can adjust the dampening in real time it's just feels so good yeah um nice so uh do you know pricing and the availability of this set i was going to talk about the price of the the entire focus pro system it's it's crazy uh i think it's under 2k you the whole thing if you yeah the, if you want all the parts the hand grip the no the hand you need the hand the focus pro handle the motor and the lidar sensor it's under 2k i guess well actually it's less but i the, mean the, the creator combo we see here yeah but you don't have the, the hand unit the hand unit but if you just want the grip the one the grip motor one and motor the and the lidar it's under dollars. 1k yeah. It's oh yeah, here the full set is like 2k. Yeah, well, that's very impressive. Or one and a half thousand. Yeah, years. if if you compare it to other Preston or C Motion or Yeah. You know, or I mean of course Focus, they are Black, Focus Pro or I, like it, cinema systems. Uh of course we're talking something very different. It's yeah, it's very it's another game. Uh but systems you used to be in the 10k range and now we are talking like for 1k you get a fully functional focus system independent focus system that you can use with every camera every lens yeah and it's impressive all right thank hard you to beat thank you jeff thank you nino that was good uh we'll you know work a lot together next week at nab see and you at nab i will be in well, the press room editing <laughs> things he's going to be the one who's behind all the videos like the the gear news videos that so if there are problems in the videos you <laughs> there won't be any problems but if there is something you will know so if you're me. a subscriber to our youtube channel be prepared that there's going to be a lot of videos over the next two weeks i guess we try to spread them out a little bit after the show thank you jeff thank you very much no and now on to johnny johnny Wow, that's a magic, it's huh? It's magic of editing. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, we just had Jacob, we just had Jeff. We talked about all the uh, DJI stuff. That's not the only stuff, of course, that happened this week. It's probably the, some of the biggest announcements. We're just going to touch on a few things that 
this is, as I said in the beginning, a very busy week in terms of announcements because all the companies try to announce before the show, making our life hard. We will cover most of the things that we will just mention now in dedicated videos throughout the next week uh, during NAB. And those videos will be released either during or after NAB. So just that everybody knows. But sh shall we just briefly touch the subject of NAB? Because we're going to, sure. of course, be there with our biggest ever uh, team. And we will do a lot of stuff. But actually, I hope you guys will will tune in as of tomorrow, Friday, because things are, you know, uh, piling up. And there are more and more announcements. And I think as of tomorrow, it's getting even more interesting. Yeah, we will try to release, what, like four, maybe five videos a day for average, four, and then... Uh, but we try to, the not super urgent stuff, we will spread out over uh, the weeks after NEB as well because we don't want to overwhelm everybody. We don't want to kill the, the algorithm. The no? algorithm, the YouTube <laughs> algorithm as well, yeah. And, and we already know we can't, you know, like we can't go into any details, but we know there's some going to be some exciting stuff. We have to be very careful here. <laughs> very exciting stuff is coming. You know yeah. what? Shall we do a dedicated video about this exciting we stuff? We will do a dedicated video about Great. that. So the first exciting stuff that's coming. Okay. okay, nice. But now let's touch into the things we can already talk about. So the couple of announcements that happened before. Let's start off with the Tilta Kronos ecosystem of accessories for the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. Now, so Tilta um, actually spent a lot of time and thought on this, I think. They are releasing a whole professional ecosystem to accessorize your iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max. And... It's probably the most comprehensive approach I've seen so far. We've seen other companies releasing filters, um, uh, lights, other smartphone accessories, but they try to tackle everything. What do you think about this? First of all, let me ask you back. Why iPhone 15 Pro? Why everybody wants suddenly to shoot? Just as in, you know, in one or two lines. Well, we can shoot ProRes and we can shoot, shoot Log for the first time. I mean, Apple Log is you know, very similar to S-Log, for example. Um, so we have a brain. There's a good brain to start with. Yeah. Of, I mean, we both wish there was uh, maybe more flexibility with the lenses, but there is a good uh, uh, brain Radical, here. Yeah. ProRes, 10-bit, uh, uh, 4 to 2, and log. and Log. Good. So that's the first thing. Now we have the Blackmagic app, which, yep. by the way, just got an update, so it's easier to monitor... Uh, the audio and you can do uh, focus racking a bit easier but of course this is at the end of the day just a phone and you do need some accessories in order to uh, make it function as a normal camera as and you, as you said Tita came up with their own ecosystem I have to say that this system is a little bit late I mean originally it was announced around Christmas time actually Easier, yeah. yeah so what we are now April that's already four months later but we know how it is. It's not so easy to bring it all together, but I think it's uh, finally here. We will have a very close look at this system during NAB, and and then I you can take you can tell they take took it seriously. I mean, the, they produced a very nice film for the launch. Uh, it's like an Xmas. I guess you can see that this was a Christmas thing originally because it's a Christmas story, which was shot by Claudio Miranda. So they didn't, you know, they didn't joke around here honestly i mean it's like uh yeah it's, a, it's like a real production <laughs> yeah and you can also see the behind the scenes in our uh, article there's a, a nice video behind yeah, the scenes we'll of course put the link in the show notes as well yeah. and uh yeah it's uh but it's, i tell you of course it's it's a very nice system personally i wish that there would be like two main things that would have been tackled maybe a bit differently one is the usb connectors those are right now a separate unit and where they are located, well, that's yet yet to be seen if it's easy to work or not uh, with the USB-C because the iPhone with the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max, you can output the video signal and record externally to an SSD, let's say. And it has an SSD, that's an SSD holder, right? Or um, That's not, sure. not so clear. And that's, okay. the, that's the second thing. Uh, the, weight, the weight is now... I'm not so sure where I can actually attach the SSD. Oh, okay. And I looked at the so different... So that is the battery or...? Which one? That's a grip. No, the thing here in the middle. The thing in the middle. Where are you looking at? I need uh, to see one second. Please show me. 
this year. There, there, so there is something attached at the back, which could be an SSD or a battery. I guess it's a, it's an SSD, no? Uh, I looked at the, at the at the images that they supplied of the kit, and uh, this is also you can also watch those images. It says universal it, it, SSD holder. So okay, it's, yeah, yeah. I have to see how it works uh, because I think we are all kind of expecting some type of grip to hold the SSD. Um, yeah. Okay, but I other than that, yeah. sorry? I guess it's at the back. I'm not sure. We have to look into Exactly. This. So uh, we will see. Actually, we will have uh, two pre-production uh, pre -pre -production units to run with at the show. So we can also feel and see how it Try is. It out. Yep. That's right. And I can already promise you guys a review of this ecosystem. So we will, we will bring it back with us from NAB. We're going to work with this and see how it works for us. And What's very course, nice, in my opinion, is this the way they mount the uh, ND filter because what we've seen uh, so far, it's like, you know, like it's for swapping them is not so easy and this can be folded up or down, uh, which is quite useful, I think. It is useful, but on the other hand, there is no Vari ND solution here. And I would have, um, I personally, I would have liked to see a Vari ND solution when, 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 You're limited with time, and you want really quickly to adjust the amount of light that goes into the into into those lenses. We also see a, a, a full size HDMI port here for output. next to the USB C. Yeah, that's I, right. I wonder if that can be used at the same time with recording externally. It's a good question that we're going to ask during NAB. Yeah, I mean, of course, they're going to be limited with what Apple provides, but that's very very interesting, and I think definitely the most, ser most serious approach we've seen so far at accessorizing the iPhone 15 Pro. And yeah, Pro Max. maybe one thing that they didn't really touch here, I don't know how they're going to go with audio. I mean, uh, there is no real solution for the audio, like mm. external audio. So that will be another question that I would like to ask the guys at Tilta. Yeah. Okay, well, ag again, okay. we will do an, an interview about this and we'll probably, I will certainly also do a review. So, Watch out for our NAB coverage of the Tilta Kronos ecosystem. Let's move on to another pre-announcement we had from Aperture, the InfiniMat. So they now also have, uh, well, foldable, I guess, or rollable uh, thin LED mats and even RGB. Um, it's There's not too much detail yet because even on their website, it's just like a pre-announcement like they always like to do. But it, it looks like it's um, it, it comes, you, you can unpack it and, and then you can either use it as it is, like very flat and then just mount it like we have seen with many other foldable small solutions. Uh, or you put an inflatable uh, thing on top, which I think serves as a diffusion. That's right. And First it also, it, 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 in the FAQ on their website, it says that it actually stabilizes the whole thing. So... Because one of the problems uh, that some of those mats have that, of course, they can hang through in the middle because you put them on the ceiling or something as a ceiling light or, or, or in a car. Uh, it's very popular as using as a very thin way, of course, to attaching to the roof inside a car to illuminate that. But sometimes or, you know, even in a studio, it, the problem is that it can hang through. And if you put the, the uh, inflatable thing on top, it stabilizes the whole thing so you don't need to have very rigid frames or anything like that. I think it's important to say that that's not a completely new idea in general. We've course, seen this yeah. with other companies. It's the first time that Aperture, Aperture is uh, showing something like this. And I think it's also important to say that those mates are coming in different sizes, mm. which is really great. Uh, yeah, again, we will conduct... Uh, an interview during NAB with the guys at Aperture to learn more about this particular um, development. I mean, it's quite, th those things are always very interesting, uh, especially when they come in, in the bigger sizes and they give or should give a very flat um, a light or very flatter, flattering uh, a light source. And yeah, I, I'm very curious to see how, how those look in reality. Yeah, and it's amazing that the size differences are quite enormous. So um, there's just going to be very large options available. I'm sure they're going to show them off at NEB as well. All right, sticking with lights, let's just mention the new announcement from Light Panels. They just announced the Astra IP bicolor LED panels. Now, Light Panels, I mean, they were really the first ones to introduce uh, one-by-ones or in general LED lighting 
to everybody. I mean, the, um, they've been around for th since the 2000s. 2001? No, I think, I think 2000. Ah, yeah, 2001. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. You know, I we, I had the first one. Those 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 were two owners. I remember, it was a American company. The light was very like a block thing, and has a very it had a very heavy battery. Uh, I think I was running really half around the world with this device, but that's very long time ago. Since then, the company was sold to Videndum, and yeah, they're also holding the patent for 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 that type of LED light. And uh, we know that in the past, when other companies tried to do this without licensing, I think uh, Videndum or what, um, yeah, they were kind of after them. I think it was kind of sorted out. With well, many... I don't know if the patent is still valid because it doesn't have endless valid validity, but well, I don't know. I don't know. But... Yeah, but now we have a lot more options, of course, and we have companies like Aperture and many others that are producing very high quality lights at a low price. Everybody. I mean, there's and... so many companies who are doing this. But anyway, light, light panels are still going strong with the Astra. And as you said, this is now kind of uh, water... How should we define this? It's R not waterproof. No, it's, it's a rotten it's resistant. resistant. Yeah, yeah it's like can... a... It's splash proof probably, but the a uh, little bit more, I guess. That's an IP rating, which That's is right. clearly defining how um, how waterproof it is. But I, I like the design. I mean, if you look at the back, it looks very modern. It's almost like a sci-fi kind of look. I think they have three different sizes again: a two by one, a one by one, and like a half size, which is nice because I often think that the the normal one by one is actually too large. We don't. Yeah, that's my favorite. My personal favorite is here. the half size. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what is the IP rating? Because Sixty-five. No, some people know uh, this stuff better than me. Oh, one, one second, let <laughs> yeah. me see quickly. We are talking about IP sixty-five. Yeah, yeah sixty-five. Ingress yeah. protection rating, weatherproof con construction, and resistant to dust, water, and even snow, which is of course important, um, and something that those lights often have been suffering from because in the old days when you were still using a lot of hot lights, uh, you could actually use them in the rain because when they were hot. Uh, you know, like it was evaporated kind it, of it, 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 like water evaporated, touching yeah. the light uh, outside. And uh, that is, of course, not true with LEDs. So it's very nice to see that those are um, uh, weatherproof. And yeah, they have a CCT range between 2700 to 6500 Kelvin. Of course, uh, being bicolor uh, means that they're usually brighter than the RGB versions. Um, um, so that's quite useful. Um, yeah, but I mean, they, the market is flooded with those type of lights. Also, the yeah. IP rated uh, IP rated lights. Uh, I want to see. I'm very curious to see how those will be uh, accepted. We know the company. We know the brand name, but the competition is very strong. Yeah, I mean, it's really. Uh, and one of the one by ones is a thousand dollars, so it's still a significant expense. Yeah, it's more expensive than the competitors. Yeah, yeah. Of course. All right, let's move on. Uh, we had a significant firmware update to the Lumix S52 and S52X. I've yep. been using the S52 quite a lot lately, and it's nice. I mean, it like I like the image stabilization. Um, one of the what, best Panasonic what, Lumix. Absolutely. It's really one of the best stabilizations ever. It's really yeah, amazing. it's it's very impressive. And uh, you know, also compared to everything else in the market, I mean, uh, I think it's much better than on the Alpha series uh, from Sony as well. But uh, they just announced a new firmware upgrade. Uh, what does it do? Well, there are two main things. One is finally, it's the you know like the latest buzz is camera to cloud uh, filming, and now with the latest update, update you can actually record camera to cloud. Uh, that means that you can actually do video proxy uh, files next to RAW and JPEG. And that's the camera to cloud by Frame.io, right? That's, yeah, uh, it's connected uh, to Frame.io. So, of course, you need a way to connect. But when you have that, uh, you don't need any any adapter or anything. And that's really nice. I think it's uh, now we can see it's becoming more and more streamlined with other companies too, the camera to cloud workflow. And I also have to say something as a side note, maybe as an anecdote. We talked to one of the leading um, recording media manufacturers about different ideas. And uh, the gentleman said that on the long run of camera manufacturers, there is actually no recording media inside the camera like when the, when the camera manufacturer is looking at the long term. So meaning 
everything eventually will be record, recorded to the cloud. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how it's going to be. We, we better be ready mentally to, <laughs> to I'm, something. I'm, like yeah, that. actually, now that you mention it, I'm surprised that there is no camera, on, like normal camera in the market yet, which actually has an eSIM built in. Because now that we have 5G speeds, it would definitely be possible to put that inside the camera, meaning, you know, like not only have Wi-Fi, but also a really mobile connection, which would make it completely independent. Because, of course, that would make so much sense to, especially with 5G speeds, to have proxy uploading in the background. Yeah, I mean, Sony has this dedicated... Uh Well, what not phone. The, the, it's not, not a phone, phone exactly. but it looks like a phone exactly yeah. so there is a device <laughs> like this uh, but not I don't think it's within the yeah uh, I think it will be, be the standard because 5G also of course uses a lot less power than 4G meaning that it wouldn't drain the battery as fast um, and yeah once they once they I think once uh, 5G rolls out more we will see more and more of that over the next mm. few years but yeah I mean it will be the internet of things Like all the things that we use uh, that are electronic will be connected to the to the cloud, yeah. uh, whether we like it or not. But it will happen, and yeah. I'm sure cameras will follow. And the other enhancements are the the photo, the autofocus is now is even more enhanced, and the stabilization that uh, we both like very much. And there's a new what like a burst SH, mode exactly uh, for photographers, of course. And but let's stick actually with Frame.io. They just announced uh, what looks like the biggest update I've seen to their platform yet, um, and it's still a closed beta. So I, I sign us up for the waiting list. We use Frame.io quite a lot for our workflows with remote editors and like people all around the world working for Cinity. And also camera to cloud, as sometimes and at some exhibitions. Cloud. Yeah. But especially the normal editing workflows with feedback and everything, Frame.io works really well for us for that. Um, now, so far, people and we have been mainly using it just to feedback on videos and also share assets because actually also their upload is quite reliable and fast. Um, but now they just announced uh, quite a big upgrade that completely changes the way it looks in a way and it makes it a lot more versatile. So um, there's so a really upgraded viewer that looks much more enhanced. Um, you can get... Previews. You can still upload while you are feedbacking in the background, which is kind of useful. I had this problem before that I can't actually write feedback while I'm uploading assets uh, unless, of course, I open a separate tab or something like that. But you can still do this now in the web app. Um, and uh, you can change the size of the preview. Uh, like dynamically, you can move this around. Uh, you can You can swap actually the um, uh, aspect ratios so you can get previews of the same content you can change from horizontal to vertical and see like a pre-crop and stuff like that they have completely revamped the tagging and metadata thing so for example if you have a director looking at shots they can easily mark this as um, you know an approved shots and so on you know i'm really happy that you're excited because I'm much less excited with this update. Why is that? It looks like a nice cosmetical thing, and maybe it's working better, but the main feature is still missing for me. And you know, Frame.io is owned by Adobe. And when we work with Adobe Premiere, what I would like eventually is to be able to edit from within Frame.io. I don't want to download the material from Frame.io and then go to editing. If the material is already in in the cloud, why there is not why there is no way to actually edit from Frame.io? You mean like an online version of Premiere built it, into Frame.io? It doesn't have to be an online version of Premiere. Premiere can be it because there there is a way to. I mean, it is connected. Frame.io is connected to Adobe already, but as far as I remember, oops, sorry. As far as I remember, there is no way to import clips directly to the timeline and start editing. That's true. I mean, there's still a little bit of a, like you can see that they acquired them and it was not natively built by Adobe because of course, like a lot of the integration could be closer. Yeah, but yeah. now what we are, or I don't know, I can't remember how many years we're into this integration. I would have expect 
that that will have a priority yeah. because that's you know that will be so logical. I mean, there are other companies that are offering. Well, I think maybe they still want to stay independent in a way that because I'm sure they have a huge user base that is actually not editing in Premiere. They will surely have a huge user base that is editing in DaVinci, which is becoming more and more popular. As we saw in the poll that we did, <laughs> we had half of the 2,000 people that took part in the poll are actually using DaVinci as their main editing. So tool. imagine if you could have done it also from DaVinci. That's not. That it's not only about that direct editing it's about directing direct editing in adobe premiere because frame io is owned by yeah fair uh, point adobe. i mean the more obvious thing of course that is a that is probably a much bigger step that they are probably already working in the background but that's a huge that's a whole new feature set i mean it wasn't originally concepted as something as an online editing thing but of course it makes sense once the assets are there to do at least like a, a rough edit there and then maybe download a project file that you can continue editing once you have downloaded everything. Totally makes sense. But the one thing that's still missing for me is there's still no Android app, which is crazy. You, you, you're still iOS only and their their iOS app is very good. I use it a lot on the go to feedback on edits um, and it's now much more enhanced as well. But there is no Android app, like nothing, not even, the, not even a viewer, nothing. And the second thing that also our writer Masha pointed out when she wrote the article, there are really no AI features built in, which is funny because Adobe is embracing AI quite a lot and they have a lot of things um, already working in their softwares, but not in, in Frame.io. So for example, the most obvious thing would have be, of course, be automatic transcription of interviews. It's not there. And that's something like I would immediately, you know, that would be like an extra feature that people would pay for. Um, because having transcriptions of, especially imagine shooting with your camera to cloud uh, enabled camera, uploading the proxies before the uh, director actually goes into the edit, he could already have the transcript the least, and yeah. that would make life so much easier if it's there. Yeah. Um, so I wish there was also a translation, but yeah, you know, that's the same thing. I mean, somewhere. you have to start with a transcript and then you can yeah. translate it. But so those are things that are definitely also missing, but but we see that they are, you know, making big steps. It's not like, because for a long time, I actually thought about this the other week, where it's like, this hasn't changed much at all since they took over. But we know how it is. Companies get integrated. People leave the company. Other people come in, you know, like Michael Sioni left and, and some others. And of course, a lot of the development team changed, I'm sure, and was integrated with Adobe. So it took them some time to, and now this is, I guess, the first, big update that we see since they took over um, but yeah so you can join the waiting list um, of course we're going to put the link in the show notes for the article which has all the further information like for like with all the other topics we're talking about um, and you can join the waiting list if you're a frame.io user all right um, what else two three more things well there is a small company from germany called proton that uh claims to release world's smallest broadcast camera at NAB 2024. That's quite a bold statement, I think, because... What, what is broadcast? Exactly, Those what days? is broadcast? No. <laughs> like everything, like in the old days, we were like, uh, you know, like people were like, oh, if it can't shoot 422 color space, it's not broadcast. But it's all, that is so long ago. Uh, everything is broadcast now. I mean, every... Well, everything is broadcastable, yeah, let's every, say, but I'm sure GoPro. the TV stations... Uh, still have those specifications. So all we have is actually an image of uh, a camera and there is like some two dices next to it, I guess as a size comparison, how small it will be. Um, it looks like it's not going to be able to record internally because it already has the wires digging out here. And we don't know anything about, I think, resolutions or frame rates or the actual size. So uh, Omri, who wrote the article, actually did a lot of comparison to other small cameras because we didn't know much. Um, but uh, yeah, it's we'll see what it is. In the back of my mind, somewhere here, whatever left from my brain, I think I saw those guys already at IBC, last IBC in Could September. Be. I mean, it's tiny. It's like three by three centimeters. It's like this. Mm. And something, yeah. Let's see. I mean, I'm sure we we probably. It looks interesting. 24 grams, <laughs> so it 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 can literally go anywhere. Um, but we'll see. Uh, hopefully, we'll 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 see more at NAB. Yeah. All right. Um, Atlas. Atlas announced the or uh, three new focal lengths for the Orion Anamorphics, the two X Anamorphics that they have. Now, what's impressive? Of course, they have very long focal lengths, uh, 135 and 200 mil. But what's impressive for me is an 18 millimeter. 
anamorphic 2x squeeze. What I think does that we mean? Both, first of all, I think we both like to film anamorphic um, when, it, when it's wide. It has another power to it. And the other thing is that this is um, on top of the existing 21, 25, 32, 40, and 80, 65. Um, and uh, what is there? Uh, 80 and 100 millimeter that the Atlas already has. Yeah, So th th those three lenses are uh, add, add on. And as you said, 18 millimeter. Wow, that's really... It's like a nine millimeter spherical, no? If it's a two x squeeze, you do the math. I'm very the mathematic uh, so. calculations. It's very yeah. wide. It's one hundred. It says one hundred forty uh, degree field, field, field of view. view. So that's like almost one hundred eighty. It's like almost like a fish eye lens. But I'm sure it's not distorting like that. So that's going to be an interesting thing to see. I think it's the they say it's the widest one in the market. Um, yeah, so. we will definitely talk to uh, Dan, Dan from yeah. that's right from Atlas during the show and hear more about those interesting lenses, especially the wide one, yeah. Last up, but not least, we'll touch on two Ari announcements. Ari uh, um, already announced that they upgraded their L-series Fresnel LEDs, which have been in the market for, what, 12, 13 years. They were one of the first ones to actually do LED Fresnels, which mm. are actually still surprisingly rare, to be honest. I mean, you have, like... Uh, those one by one shapes and stuff like that and COB lights from a lot of manufacturers with often Fresnel attachments but native Fren Fresnel uh, lights there's not that many out there and um, I can think of some but maybe not that strong yeah I am surprised because it's something I think there's still a bit of a gap in the market to have hard LED light is still it's possible you can make it mostly with attachments um, but it's nice to have a you know, like one light that already has it built in. So you don't need to use attachments and make it bigger. So the, of course, the RE ones are very much targeted at the high end and uh, studio scenes. Uh, what's new is that it's now 90% brighter uh, and it has very advanced uh, network um, connectivity, which wasn't the case with the first generation. So uh, that's interesting. You get them in the um, very well-known silver blue look and also in black, which is good because, of course, that's much less reflective and, um, yeah, fully connectable and uh, with DMX and all, all you need, basically. And the second announcement? The second announcement, which is quite recent, we... Um, Right now, we don't have the article yet on the website, but uh, just the RE website here. Um, Alexa 35 Live System. So an uh, accessory system for the very popular Alexa 35 to make this camera into a real live multicam system with so fiber connections. broadcast kind of. Kind of broadcast. I mean, like for big concerts and, and sports and stuff. Like if you really want to use an Alexa 35 and make it a... Uh, um, yeah, live concert camera, for example, multicam thing. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. And we know a lot of people who are pioneering in this way that are really doing multicam with large sensor camera uh, cameras. And now it's natively possible. I mean, it was possible before, but now you can actually have this uh, fiber attachment and really get fiber 4K uncompressed uh, video out of the um, Alexa 35 and make it into a broadcast camera. Um, that's that's quite impressive. Um, yeah, and it's like a whole ecosystem of accessories, of course, that's needed to integrate that. But yeah, I think that's Good. all. It's, we... It reminds me a little bit what Fujinon is doing with the Duvo uh, lenses. You know, when they're catering the large or the the large format cameras with what used to be broadcast, but they kind of moved away and and trying to give more on the lens side for those cameras. It's all, For me, it's a bit similar with what uh, Ari is trying to do with the Alexa, bring Alexa from the filmmaking niche more into the broadcast. It's, I'm sure it's a much bigger market, of course. And also, I think there's a general trend that we can see that large sensor cameras are really going into every area of production where it used to be only cinematic look. And now it's really like, I mean, who has used them? You know, like a lot of productions that I know that used to use XD cam from Sony uh, or the Vari cams from Panasonic are, are have moved into um, the large sensor options, uh, and and it it's just kind of it seems like it's dying out. Even for 
not for news yet. I guess news is the one bastion of XD cam in a way. But I feel like, you know, like we can see, of course, there's an advantage of having small sensors because you have a much bigger focal range with a smaller lens. Um, it's also easier to focus. For, don't forget, not everybody is very, very but, qualified. But yeah, it's so. changing with a good autofocus. So yeah, also, yeah. That's, uh, I, I just hear from a lot of productions, even here in Austria, that productions that have been going on for uh, decades sometimes are now switching to large, large sensor because actually very often, of course, a camera person, DP, will retire and then a new one comes in and will actually... Um, yeah. make Change of generation. Huh? Change of generations. And I think a lot of... Uh, you know, like I would say, I don't know, below 50, below 40 are really kind of born into the into the um, large sensor shooting and, and don't even want to shoot with a small sensor anymore. And of course, it maybe we should cool. maybe we should once actually tackle what happened to the to the to all of those broadcast cameras. Those used to be the bread and butter of many companies like Sony, Panasonic and so on. The other companies that we don't deal with on on, on daily uh, basis, some uh, Japanese companies, yeah. but it seems like all, for example, example Ikigami. Um, but yeah, what happened actually to this broadcast market? Maybe It'd be interesting is, to hear how sales have changed for those as mm. well. I think yeah. Yeah. Good. All right, let's wrap it up here. Uh, we are, as I mentioned before, heading out to NEB tomorrow. Um, we will record a podcast at in las vegas next week at the end of the show so we can actually talk about everything that has been announced that we haven't talked about yet and everything that we've seen um and yeah um thanks everybody for watching yeah but really please join us there will be a lot of yeah. exciting news during nab and also for the first time we're gonna have very heavy social media coverage that is also dedicated for social media as well so even if you're subscribed to youtube you will miss stuff if you're not subscribed to Instagram uh, because we will have some dedicated content going up there, which is also showing a little bit more behind the scenes of NAB and how those big trade For example, work. did For you example. ever wondered how the food is during NAB? That will be covered in our Instagram channel. Uh, you will not <laughs> like that. Okay. Good. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Bye.